It's interesting, it just doesn't comes to mind. In the Altarev Shekh Norach, he talks about giving tzedakah by 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 Yavach David. He mentions that you should give tzedakah standing. I don't know what it means after over there, but okay. Right. So we're going to start today's Shia, and because the Rebbe encouraged us during this time to learn about the Besa Migdosh, so we've been learning about the Besa Migdosh in Rambam, and here we have a picture which is meant to be of the Lishka Sagozis. Lishka Sagozis is a chamber which is at the on the north side of the Besa Migdosh or the Azara. And the way it's described in Gemara is Chetzre Bakoidash Chetzre Bachoil. And the Chalik, which the part which is in Choil, that's where the Sanhedrin would sit. That was the supreme Sanhedrin. And in order for them to be allowed to sit, it was had to be a mockum of Choil because Ein Yeshiva Ba'azoro, Elo Le Malche Bez David Bilvad. No one's allowed to sit in the Azara uh, unless other than Malche Bez David. Then they have the Chelik Bakoidesh, the outer part, the part which was closer to the Azara, that was Kodesh. And now here they've got where it says in the Mishnah, when the particular point after the first stage of the Avoida, there was a break in the schedule, and they would go to the Lishka Sagozas and read the Shema. But the artist has drawn the Koranim sitting for saying the Shema, which may be correct, Api Kabbalah, because Shema has got to do with Elam Mabriya. But um, how does this fit with the halacha that ein yeshiva v'azoro elo l'malche bez dovid bilvad? So that no one else should be sitting there. Now you might think that the side chambers, which have got kedusha z'azoro, don't have the isur to sit there, but the rishonim don't learn that way, and we're going to see the tosfos in a moment. And so therefore comes the question: if the Kohanim are not allowed to sit in the Azara. Now, never mind the Shema. They have a mitzvah to eat Karbonus. Now, this Karbonus are divided into two groups, or Kodshe Kadoshim and Kadoshim Kalim. Kodshe Kadoshim Kalim may be eaten anywhere in the, in the uh, anywhere in Yerushalayim. Kodshe Kadoshim are only allowed to be eaten in, in the Azara, only Zichre Kahuna, etc. And carbonus normally we know are meant to be eaten in a chosh of a way, in a respectable way. So here you're telling me that the koyanim are not, are not allowed to sit. And here it's the koyanim have a mitzvah to eat the flesh of the carbonus. And by the way, I also don't know where it's discussed, where they roasted, where they cooked the carbonus. You have lishkas anazirim and lishkas hametzeroim, uh, <clears throat> which were uh, in the Ezras Noshim. That's for Kadoshim Kalim, but where did they cook the Kadosh Kodshi Kodshim? I don't know. But meanwhile, let's take a look about this idea of Koyanim sitting in the Azoro or in the in the adjacent rooms. So here this is a Toysvis in Yuma Daf Chofhei, where Toysvis addresses this and he says, it says, Ein Yeshiva Bazora, oh, you're not allowed to sit in the Azoro. And so then Titus asks this question, what happens about, um, how do they eat? So first Titus says um, that possibly because the achil is tzorich avoida, because the tzich and the eating is, is part of the needed for the avoida, therefore it may be done, uh, they, may, they are allowed to, they're allowed to uh, sit whilst they're eating. Then Tosus says another teretz inami yeshloimar the hainu time the muta leishi v'lech mekodshim because it says by the carbonus the moshchal legdula that you are allowed that they should be eaten in a respectable way. Therefore, so one the first telling thing is because it's a mitzvah. The other one says it because it has to be in a privileged way, a chosher way. Then Tosus towards the end says, "I will in the Don't give me the excuse." That you're allowed to, they're allowed to sit in the chambers which are adjacent, which are benuyos bechoyel b'suchas lekodesh. The chambers which are adjacent, which are outside, but they are open to the kodesh. That they've got the kedushas azara, that they're still you're allowed to eat kodesh kadoshim there, but you are allowed to seat, be seated there. So Tosa says that's that he doesn't accept that. The whole mashma, 
the leishiv nami havi kazoro atzmo of also leishiv because the Gemara Yumo certainly gives us the impression that you're not allowed to sit even in the adjacent rooms because of kudshas hazara. So Tosis dismisses that. So I'm back to my question on the uh, on on the artist in our, in our previous in this picture. The fact that he depicted them reading the Shema seated, so according to Toysus, that doesn't really fit. Now, Rabbi Lou pointed out, and actually in uh, Rabbi Paris also at Mincha pointed out to me that this is in today's Shir Rambam, because in the Shir of Gimel Prochim Leyoim, in Perik Hey, Halocha, mm, Halocha Vov, in my print, it has here, Hakol Chayovim Bibichas Azimun. And he says, I feel koyanim shaochlu kotshe kadoshim boazora. That they, even the koyanim who eat kotshe kadoshim boazora, also have to make a zimun. So, what's the chiddush? Why would you think not so? So, Rabbi Parish mentioned that, that in some of us will say that the svara is that perhaps because they had to stand, therefore you might have thought that doesn't um, follow as a, as a proper zimun. He also referred me to a in Rambam Masa Karbonus, Perik Yud in Mishnah Lamelech, Aloha Gimel, where the Mishnah Lamelech he comments about sitting or standing when eating the Karbonus. And he gives a reference to um, a Toysfus, where Toysfus seems to hold that they would, they, they would stand when eating the Karbonus. Anyway, so we have here. Veniska, Venichia, Venire, the Koyanim especially uh, need to know whether they will be allowed to sit when they eat the Karbonus. Um, the Rebbe once told Rebbein Sin Shagal of Olav Shalom that he should teach his, son, his sons how to sing because soon the Besamigdus will be built and they will have to, uh, as Levim, they'll have to sing. So we have to get ready for the Bias HaMashiach and Bez Hashem will see this Lamaise. Koyanim Bavidosim, including eating the Karbanas. Okay. I was last uh, we, Shabbos, I was in uh, out of town, and there were two minyonim, nine, eight o'clock minion and nine o'clock minion. And I, I downed in the nine o'clock minion. There was someone who was still from the eight o'clock minion. And just by uh, just before Shmon Esra, my phone rang. And it was, it's very embarrassing that your phone rings in show. It's, it's, it's wrong and it's embarrassing. But this um, fellow made some kind of comment about Hashem taking the call or not taking the call. So uh, I, I, was, I didn't respond anything at the time. After davening, we had a little bit of chit chat and I saw he's a Ida Yedea Sefer, a knowledgeable fellow, knows a lot of halacha. So I asked him, are you allowed to say Hashem's name in English in the context of a joke? So for him, it was a psashtikal chiddush. He'd never heard about it. And I said, As, it's written in Shukhan Aruch, Magad Avram, etc., brings that you're not meant to use Hashem's name even in the context of a joke. So sometimes people say, oh my God, or, you, you, or something like that. That's uh, Shalai Ka'alochi, you're not allowed to do that because you're using Hashem's name, even though it is in another language, not in the Loshna Kodesh, that wouldn't be allowed. So let's read that inside. We have here from Simon Peihei in Altrevis Shechon Aruch, where he talks about the Hashem's names, the seven names, uh, Kael, Alechim, Adni, etc. Even, he says, you're not allowed to mention, here it's in Hichas Krishma, he's talking about in a place like in a, in a bathhouse where you're not allowed to say a posuk or a, a sacred thing. So he says Hashem's name, even in a foreign language, also you're not allowed to say, and even, you know, so, so, so he says here, the name which Hashem is known as in that language, as he says, got in Loshan Ashkenaz, Boga, Beloshan Poil in Verusia. So in those languages, when we say got or Boga, we mean we, that's the translation of perhaps Adni or Alekim or Havai, that doesn't really matter. The point is that they, they do have Kdusha. And although he says in writing you are allowed to erase them, 
but to mention to utter those names in a holy place is not allowed and then he goes on to say similarly in the context of mentioning Hashem's name in vain also even if it's in a foreign language not in, in Lashon HaKodesh is also forbidden I just want to digress for a moment here the Alter Rebbe has said that you would be allowed to erase G-O-D for example he says it doesn't have Kedusha in the script uttering in a, a non-sacred place is not allowed but to erase the script is allowed the, the fact is though that there are poskim who are stricter about that and we know that in all Haredish forum and uh, including perhaps led by this forum published by Merkel's Lidyan Echinuch wherever there is a not in a sitter but if it's like a, a, a brochure etc when it has Hashem's name G-O-D you know, we spelt with a G dash D and there's a reference to the Urim V'tumim I think in Simon Chofhei where he talks about that there is a Kedusha in Hashem's name even in this in the written form and therefore when she when doesn't write G-O-D in a a text which will probably end up in the in in, in a disrespectful place so let's come back so we've got here that one doesn't say Hashem's name even in English or Russian whatever it may be uh, other than in the context of prayer or acknowledgement to Hashem so if a guy says to you how you're doing you say thank God that's I think perfectly legitimate because you're using it in a form of in a, in, in a correct form but to use it in uh, um, in, in just as an expression without really meaning a an awareness of Hashem in that and in that, in that point is not it's not okay and I just want to show you that when they when they started singing by the Rebbe the Nigin of Niet Nikavo so Niet Nikavo we know there's nothing besides Hashem that's the, those are the words in Russian so I'm going to read the Sikha it's from I think Tovshin uh, Chofei, possibly, yeah. It's, I think it'd be his Tammuz. And he says that Reb Mechol Dvorkin, the Chosid Reb Mechol Dvorkin, over several years had been working in a forest with Goyim. And therefore he had picked up several expressions in Svas in Russian. And so he also was singing this song of Ein Oid Milvadoi. He was singing in Russian with Russian words. Niet niet nikavo, there is nothing. Nietu nietu nikavo, kromi. Now, the Rebbe says here there should be Hashem's name. And now I'm going to take the liberty of saying, perhaps I shouldn't make, we're learning this entire. Kromi boga adnavo. That was the, the original Russian wording of the song. And the Rebbe says, but he didn't say it that way because according to the Psakdin and Poskim, which the Altarebbe brings in Shekhanarach, which we just read, one shouldn't mention Hashem's name even not only in Hebrew but even in another language. So therefore, the wording was changed to Krom Yivo. Krom Yivo means other than him, rather than saying other than G O D, to say Krom Yivo other than him. So there is this sensitivity which from a Yidden have that we don't refer to Hashem in conversation. We don't use the word God um, so much in conversation. We use the word. Abishta, Hashem, Bashefer, and all of this is out of a sensitivity not to be using uh, Hashem's name, even in English or Yiddish, um, other than in the context of prayer or of praise of Hashem. Let's move on to the next point. Okay. So I was asked by Yemash Giyach in the hotel, is there an issue for if he light if the pilot light has been lit by a, a yid may the goisha chefs now continue working with the with the uh, by turning on the fire from the pilot light so so what we have here this is in the dinim of of uh Bishul akum so we have here about the lighting of the oven and now there's a difference between bread the haloch is to make bread pas Yisrael and making food bishol Yisrael. Bishol Yisrael is a little bit stricter. And here there's a difference between the Asfardim and Ashkenazim. 
Let's go straight to the Minik uh, Ashkenazim. Yesh Cholkim, the Machaber does not allow Shgira, he doesn't allow uh, just the lighting of a fire or throwing a piece of wood into the fire for Bishulakim, only for Pas. But Yesh Cholkim, Svira Luhu, the Hazlokas Eish, or Chita Begacholim. But that if a Yid lights the fire or if a Yid stokes the embers, that's enough to make it Bishul Yisrael, just like it is enough to make it a Pas Yisrael. So Here's one area where the Minig Hasfardim, the Bishul Yisroel, according to Sfardim, is strict to the Bishul Yisroel, according to Ashkenazim. And then, towards the end, the Maramor says, V'yesh o'imrim, afilo lechita Yisroel, even if he didn't tamper with the fire at all. V'lehish lechshlom shom kesam, rak shehagoyo hid, hagoyo hidliko ho'esh me'esh el Yisroel. Now, the last opinion says that even if a Yid lit a first fire, and then the Goy lights the, lights the fire from there, that's also called Bishul Yisroel. So in, there's, an, oh, there's a, a home here in this area where they have a kitchen with Goyesha staff. They have a Yorzeit candle. The Mashgiach lights the Yorzeit candle. And if in the middle of the day, the, uh, one of the staff needs, one of the Goyesha staff needs to make uh, cook some food. So they will know that they will light the fire. They'll take a... A match and light it from this yard side candle, and then with this they will light the uh, stove. So that's how they rely for Bishul Yisrael. So what we're seeing here is that it's a yesh oimrim. So I mean, possibly there's room to be machmir that there should be dafka yid lighting the actual fire, not esh me esh. But um, the bottom line is that there is a heter that um, if the if, uh, with a pilot light lit, lit by a yid, so then. It would be called Bishul Yisrael, but of course there's room for higher standards than that, not to rely on that Yesh Aymrim. Okay. Let's move on. Now here I'm going to do something which I don't usually do, and that is to confess that I made a, a, a think, a, a, a wrong psak. And I got a call from uh, a school, and there was a group of uh, class which had been making biscuits and they had a non-Jewish teacher, and the non-Jewish teacher switched on the oven and put the first batch of biscuits into the oven. Now, then the question was, uh, um, was raised, is this called, is this called Pas Yisrael? Because the, uh, the children had shaped the biscuits, but the lighting of the fire and putting the biscuits into the fire was done by a god. So, in my mind, I had something that, that the, if a Yid had made the sh shape of the loaves is enough to say it's called Pas Yisrael, which I was mistaken on that. And so I'm going to read from the uh, Oroch HaShulchan in Simen Kuf Yud Beis. Bada de halisha v'ho'aricho lav klumbu. The fact who made the dough and who shaped the loaves, that doesn't count. Dim ofa ha Yisrael. If it was baked by a yid, even if the goy made the dough, that would be okay. But if it's the other way around, if a yid had shaped the loaves and a goy had baked it, that would not be okay. That's the, that's so they, 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 it's clear that the fact that the children had shaped the, the biscuits was not enough of a heter to uh, permit this. Now, what happens? There's a din, there are heterim for pas palter, but then there's the shokhanach is stricter when it comes to a goy baking a Jew's bread. And that's it's interesting to buy the goy's bread, which uh, as he's a baker, there's a heter. For a goy to bake a Jew's bread, they say it's stricter, but they say that's because of, 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 of like Bishul Akum. Just like if a koi cooked food for you, you have a problem with bishul akum. So if a goi baked your bread, it would be under, also under the din of bishul akum. So I was just thinking perhaps there's a stickles a heter on that basis by saying that the biscuits are not oil shulchan malachim. You don't have biscuits for a, for, for a meal. And therefore, possibly it wouldn't come to, under the issue of bishul akum. So but yeah, but perhaps you could rely on that. But okay. But for the future, I will have to remember this. Meshe would often say, Ein Adam oimed al halacha ela im ba. You make a mistake, and this way you'll remember for the next time. Right, let's move on. 
Um, okay. Right. When we serve food on Shabbos, we are normally um, are accustomed that we take the pot off the fire. I'm told to make a difference between the word bis biscuit and, and we mean in the, well, the Americans called cookies. Um, otherwise, it might be misunderstood. Okay, let's move on. So normally we take um, we take the pot off the fire when we're going to serve food on Shabbos. And the reason is because stirring food is part of the cooking process, and that's called magis. Now, then, what about if it's totally cooked? So then it's not really cooking in any case, but it's fully cooked in any case. But it's perhaps nearer kemavashal. So let's read this halacha inside. A pot has been taken, it's boiling hot, it's been taken off the fire. And if it's not fully cooked, you mustn't ladle out any food. Because if the food is not fully cooked and you're taking a ladle, so you are stirring, although your intention is to ladle some of the food out, but you are effectively uh, you're, you're stirring. And that's going to be an, an issue of, of cooking, as discussed earlier. But if the food has been fully cooked, you are allowed to stir it. Only once it's taken off the fire. We see that whilst it's on the fire, you wouldn't be allowed to stir it. That's in the middle, I've taken out a piece which talks about uh, when it's dye coloring um, fabrics yes um, but you could swear as you know the others who are more machmir or roots la hachmir yachmir bahagosa mamsh that even if the pot is off the fire one shouldn't stir it aber lo hoitz bechaf to take out with a with a ladle ein la hachmir klal ben is bashlo kol sorka ve eno alaish but to ladle out and the pot is removed from the fire then that's okay, and you're, th th there's no problem of magis there. So we know that. The question which we have in our case here is, does, I have a, a, a it's a hotel, and there's a goyesha chef, and he is taking the food out of the pot. Does the goy have to take the food off the fire before serving the soup? Or can he serve soup? whilst it's still on the fire. Again, the soup is fully cooked. Even if I would stir it myself, I would be maximum being in violation of, of Maris Ayin. If it was not cooked and I'm ladling out, then I would be cooking, even though it's not my intention, but would say psikresh, etc. Generally with the Goy, we take a position that we don't worry about psikresh. If I tell the goy to do A, I tell the goy to open the fridge and the light is going to go on, that's not a worry. It's not my worry. So I, I feel that the same would apply that to that the goyish chef is allowed to ladle out the soup whilst the soup is still on the fire. I'm, I'm, I'm going to declare my, um, my bias here because, because I davened late. Is Manoi. By the time I came to get the soup, the soup was cold. It wasn't freezing cold, but it, was, it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think that it really would be okay to ha have left it on the fire because it's the Goy who's doing the serving and I don't think ha we have to worry about all of these humorous of not ladling out if a Goy is doing the actual act. Let's move on. Someone asked me a question. He's, let's, for example, he's selling schach. And now schach comes in packages also. It is schach, lonetzach, whatever they call them, kainas. How about if you have uh, a posuk or a couple of words from a posuk about the schach and it's on the packet of the schach? Or if you're selling um, grapes and you have a posuk, I know it's uh, wrong spelling, but fine. So is there an issue of, of having words from a posuk 
on a package. So here we have a halacha in Hichasuka, actually. In Alter Rebbe Shechon Aruch, where it says, Tzafr Shalom Ches, Oyson Anoshim Shechokikin Posuk Basukas Teshbu, Al Hadalaz, Vesolim Basuka Lenoi, those people who take a marrow and they carve out from the marrow, they carve out the woods of Basukas Teshvu and they put it up to de decorate the sukkah. So if you think Halloween is a <laughs> the marker of, of taking a marrow and making shapes and making a, uh, making a, a message on it, it looks like it was the were Yidin who were doing that. I don't know who took it from whom. Kolponim, it says, We shouldn't use marrows to put up sukim in the uh, sukkah. One wouldn't be allowed to write a posuk on its own. It'd have to be a whole sefer. As discussed in Yeridei Rishpe Gimel, the chakika hikiksivale inyaze, and carving is the same as writing. So here we have a problem of writing a posuk on a marrow to, and de which to decorate the sukkah. The Alter Rebbe refers to here there of Rish Pe Gimel. So here we have uh, from the, the in Rish Pe Gimel. It says here, um, if you have a scroll with three, you said also lirkaim psukim betalis. You wouldn't be allowed to embroider psukim on a talis. And we're not talking about Hashem's name. Just just the psukim. And what does he say further? Also, now this is in the Taz, I believe, in the Shach. In the shach. Also, what's going to happen is that this posuk will become will be exposed to a disgrace because the tzitzis of the talus are only tashmisha mitzvah. People very often ask, what should I do with an old talus? Really, when I did an old talus, once it's out of commission, you are allowed to wrap it up and put it in the bin. And you're allowed to go to with the talus in the Vesakisa, he says, we don't. The one which we for davening. At any rate, so then, then you but you to leave the posuk on the talus. The talus may be exposed to disgrace, and the posuk will be disgraced. So this is not talking about shamans. So we have here a problem of writing a posuk uh, in a place where it's going to come be exposed to disgrace. So I told the uh, the one who asked me this question about putting a posuk on the packaging if he would somehow let's say take one of the letters let's say the letter hey and the letter hey would be broken that in the vertical and the horizontal piece where they can meet there should be a slight gap and that way it doesn't have pro it's not a proper writing if you look carefully on the in the shaila moira print or in the for that matter in the uh Dvar malchus the chumash in the Dvar malchus so that's what they they're using a text where the hey for hashem's name is always a broken hey now, if someone's asking about an opshernish where they added a psukim to the cake. I think you actually mean by a reinfernish to cheder. And there, the whole word is that the children eat the posuk. And it's that they're actually the posuk which is, is written is, is uh, a posuk, I think, in Yeshaya, which talks about taking it into your into yourself. Yeah, so you're, if someone's asking about uh, psukim on invitations in Ikhanami, one should be careful not to use psukim on invitations. And uh, I think I mentioned before, I've got a whole sefer all about Seamus called Ginze Kodesh, and you've got about five pages of all different announcements where you'd want to use a posuk and you'd have to uh, modify them slightly. So, like instead of Baruch um, Habo, you can make Bruchim Haboim. Yeah, Baruch Habo Hashem as a posuk yeah, in, in Halo. If you write Bruchim Aboim, Vashem Hashem, so yeah, it's not a possible. So you can do those kind of modifications to avoid this problem. Okay, let's move on. Um, oh, I don't know what happened over here. Okay, I got a, a, a question. One of our regular listeners, not, uh, he listens to the recording. His name is Rebbe Tal Basman, uh, Talmud Chochem, who lives in Pittsburgh. And his mother passed away uh, last week. So, uh, for him our condolences but meanwhile he asked me the question it's very common that people uh, at at a levaya uh, etc will give an embrace uh, a hug to one another it's a form of uh, expression i don't know pre-covid post-covid but okay so he asked is that a union of shalom 
because an ov oval is not allowed to, we don't give shalom to an oval, and oval shouldn't, shouldn't be saying shalom to others, especially during Shiva, is embracing that kind of embrace. Does that come into the ghetto of, of shalom? So I was in Bournemouth and I met, there's a rab, he's known as Rav Chido Weiss, as the Rav, in, he's a Rav in Antwerp, and I visited him he, he, uh, on Friday. He was very gracious, and I asked him this question. And in, afterwards, on Sunday or Monday, he sent me what you have on the uh, screen, and he gives me a reference to a Gemara and Shechnoruch, where it talks about an oval, Rachman al-Islam, should not be holding a child on his lap. And therefore, if that's an issue, that perhaps um, embracing would be uh, certainly in the same category. But on the other hand, with a child, it's more of an entertainment and a distraction. And then it says that uh, in Ramo about a man shouldn't embrace his wife in the state of Avelis, which seems to say, therefore, that other embracing would be okay. So he was inclined to say it, it is okay. And I just want to go on and give you another source, which I, afterwards I looked around. And this is from the Ritvo in uh, Moid Cotton, I believe. Yeah, it's the Ritvo who says that, what about nodding? You know, we often make a nod as an acknowledgement. So that's also a form of greeting. But actually it says, when one goes to Bimnachem Oval, and one, one shouldn't overstay your welcome. And when the oval nods with his head, that is the, some should be seen as an indication that you know enough and you know leave me leave give me my space. So it has here. This is the lotion of the brayso oval. Kibun shni ana beroishoi shuv ein menachamim rashoim leishiv etzloi. Once the oval has done this nod, it's well the the people who are coming there to console and to comfort. They shouldn't continue. They should. They should take the, uh, uh, you know, the remes and go out. And so he quotes Sivar Mitzchak ben Gayut, who says that the oval has an issue of nesinas shalom. The oval may bow, to acknowledge people during the shiva. As people do when they greet someone, even mamish, because he's not actually uttering words of greeting. I, you can discuss this, you can challenge this, but what I'm seeing from the Ritva is saying that shalom is only actually using the word shalom, but other gestures, which although they are also gestures of greeting, but they don't come into the Isra of Nisinas shalom. So we have here a uh, a word from the Ritva to support the Psak of Rav Chido Weiss. Um, okay, let's move on then. Someone asked me the following. He puts money in the pushka. And so now he's asking, can he uh, exchange it with a voucher? For uh, those who are in other parts of the world, um, the vouchers here are like a, a, in every in every civilized society to nowadays. You have the government has incentives for charity, and you have a certain tax return if you give a certain amount of charity. So then the government will will match and will give you back the tax on the on the money which you give to charity, something on those lines. So I can if I uh, if I give cash, it costs me ten pounds. Costs me ten pounds. If I give a voucher. So I can give seven pounds, and the, the charity will be able to get from the from the from the uh, from the government three pounds. So I, it costs me seven pounds to give ten pounds. That's that's his question. So can I is is the I've got money in the pushka, and then I take out ten pounds. So if I take out seven, wait a minute, how does that work? I take out money from the pushka, and I take out ten pounds, and I put in the ten pound voucher. But that ten pound voucher only cost me seven pounds, so is that considered? Uh, is that is that correct? Is that is that acceptable? But I believe with the question. So, I just like to say the following. Let's say I earn ten thousand pounds. I earn ten thousand pounds, of which the government takes three thousand pounds. 
So I earn net seven thousand pounds. So my liability for my sir is seven hundred pounds. If I let's say write out a check of uh, of uh, five hundred pounds, so then there will be a tax return of help me about one hundred and fifty pounds. Let's say yeah, whatever it may be. So effectively, I can I can fulfill if I. If I have a, a MISA liability of 700 pounds, if I write out a check, a gift aid check of 600 pounds, and then be due to the tax return, the stocker has received 700 pounds, I have fulfilled my, 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 uh, my MISA liability. What I'm trying to say is that the money which you manage to retrieve from the tax office that is considered your money, and you are for able to fulfill your mitzvah of tzedakah and of miser by that uh, tax claim. So it, it, it becomes a little bit, uh, you know, the, the, the fine print. So let's say if I gave, if I gave uh, this check of 600 pounds, so then, I, and I get a tax return of, let's say, 200 pounds on that, so then I haven't I've earned a little bit more. I thought that before I thought I earned uh, uh, 7,000 pounds. I've actually earned 7,200 pounds. In other words, I'm saying the tax claim can also be added to your earnings, so to speak. But you can use your tax claim to cover your MISA liability. And therefore, coming back to the question which was asked, is there a problem of putting a charity voucher for the same amount as cash? So. If it's in your own home, I don't see this as a problem. In, if it's in shul, then it's a, a different story because we know, certainly those people who are into dealing with stockers, dealing with vouchers is obviously uh, tedious and it's, it, it takes time. So for someone to come into a, a shul pushka and put in a 10 pound, to, 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 to put in a 10 pound voucher and take out 10 pounds in cash, that is, uh, you're actually causing extra tircha to the garbage stocker, which I don't think is is is, is justified. And I know that uh, the late Rabin Sien Hakna Al Rasham took extreme exception to people doing that um, because it's, it's I give, just giving them extra tircha. Uh, I still think that if it's in your own home, you, you're still in full control of that. But I might be wrong in that. Okay. Let's go on to a very practical question. And I make a joke about the minhogim. Is it kapota day or not a kapota day? But this is actually a hal halacha shayla. Someone asked me for this motzeh Shabbos. Um, lesimcha, if chas v'sholom we're stuck in gollas. So do you, and it's, it's going to go to shul. Many minyonim will, will and shul, including our shul, We'll have a minion 15 minutes, let's say, after Motza Shabbos, so people should be able to come her, come to shul after Shabbos with a car and with a, wearing already uh, their plimsolls, kapota, or uh, our regular weekday clothes. So it's a good question. And generally, there's a question every Motza Shabbos, how soon, uh, when, when do you switch? To big day choil, is it? And so you can look in, say, for Michikre Min Hogim of Rabbi Gorari, volume um, base, Chelik Sheni. He's got a whole discussion about that. And he had an uncle who was a Zidat Choiva Rebbe, who was once came to the Rebbe's Fabring in the Motza Shabbos, and he wasn't wearing his Shreimel. And the Rebbe commented that uh, Motza Shabbos should also be wearing big day Shabbos. And we all know all the beautiful pictures of the. Uh, in the in the uh, in the Jewish uh, newspapers of of Lava Malkus, and they're all you know, you know, the, the beauty of it is that all the Eden, uh, all the Rabbonim wearing their streimels. So the minigah minigah stroll at large seems to be that you would wear your big Shabbos on Motzei Shabbos. Of course, now we have the particular question about our uh, our story about when it goes into um, into Tishabot. So in Nite Gavriel, he talks about wearing Big Day Chayil. And he says it's, it's okay to also wear Big Day Shabbos if you continue from Shabbos. And he quotes, he writes that the Rebbe Rebbe, 
uh, that uh, Mitya Gavril is a gracious deed. And uh, he was Mavar that the Rebbe in such a career as did wear Big Day Shabbos, followed by Echo, the Rebbe wore Big Day Shabbos. If you read the Sikha, which was published for this week from Tafshin Lamed Aled, the Rebbe talks about the Maila of Shabbos Chazoin and the Maila of Shabbos Chazoin, 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 the Maila which goes straight in Tishabov, you're going Tishabov, the Yehofech Lesibcho is coming from Shabbos straight into the, uh, the fast. So there's an idea more, you know, certainly Alder Hachasidus to kind of to want to. Um, not not create a divide between Shabbos and and uh, and the fast. Now, having said that, on the other hand, on Motzi, once it's ready Motzi Shabbos, and you said Baruch Hamad will be in Kodesh you're not allowed to wear, you're not allowed to put on Big Day Shabbos, you're not allowed to quickly put on Big Day Shabbos the whole over the nine days. He certainly wouldn't be allowed to put on Big Day Shabbos on Motzi Shabbos. So all I can say is, if someone comes into shul wearing his jacket, so the the terrace is posh because he. Uh, already said Baruch HaMavdil, and then you can't put on Big Day Shabbos. But uh, those who come with the kapotas, that's because before they said Baruch HaMavdil, they were still wearing their kapotas, or they put on the kapotas before saying Baruch HaMavdil, and then they continued wearing it into Matzah Shabbos. Um, someone is pointing out about the vouchers story. The shul would have to pay to the voucher company a fee as well. So the voucher isn't actually worth the face value of the voucher. I mean, if that's the case, you're absolutely right. Then uh, if, the, if the case is that the stocker does not get the face value of the voucher, then even in your own pushka, you wouldn't be allowed to take out a five pound note and put in a five pound voucher because you are cheating the, uh, the stocker of the uh, of a few pence, whatever they, whatever the commission is. I, I didn't know that that's the case, but if that's the case, you're absolutely right. Right. Finally, one of our, our listeners, again, this is uh, one who listens to the recordings, is, a, is actually in, in Sydney, in Australia, and he uh, has the following question. He is an assistant rabbi in a shul. And they dab in Myriv early on Friday night. He's got a, a couple of bar mitzvah boys, and they prefer go to go to a local shul where they daven Kabbalah, daven my my of So are they? Are his boys chayiv to be mekabel Shabbos? Because he's mekabel, because Tati is mekabel Shabbos early, and the same thing as his wife bound to mekabel Shabbos. Now the, the the answer to both of these is that this idea that because the Rosh Habayis, the Gedol Habayis. Is Mikabal Shabbos. Therefore, it's incumbent upon the dependents also to be Mikabal Shabbos, is not very well documented. It is, there is a Prima Godim who suggests it. The Alter Rebbe doesn't mention a word um, about this. So it's not that well documented. Okay, but the Prima Godim is a khur. There's another very important point here that there's a tshuva of the of Moshe Feinstein, Migis Moshe, and he says the following that a woman should be Mechabal Shabbos when her husband is Mechabal Shabbos. If he's doing it, he'll shame mitzvah. But if he's Mechabal Shabbos early because he wants to eat supper early, so then she's not Mechuyev not to dance. She's not, she's not bound by his, by his uh, preference to eat early. She's, if he's Mechabal Shabbos out of, out of respect for Shabbos, then she should follow along, follow suit. So other poskim disagree with that. Rav, Rav Vosna and Sheva Talevi disagrees with that. And he says a woman is bound to be Mikhail Shabbos, even if it's just because the husband wants to eat early. So again, it's not so clear. What I would say is, and this I saw in the Pisket Shuvas, he says so also uh, that in any event, if the wife is not Mikhail Shabbos early, but definitely, by the time the husband comes home from shul, she should have been Mechabal Shabbos. It's certainly inappropriate that he would come to home from shul and everyone, this one's in the shower and this one hasn't lit. That's not appropriate. It should be that when he comes home from shul, by then the candles should be lit and the family have been Mechabal Shabbos. Um, someone's put on the chat asking if we have time to advise if someone's not fasting, should they make half dollar and and what do you do about wine? 
So there are posca, this is a, a d debated in contemporary poscum. Some say, just like you have a heter to break your fast, you have a heter to eat without Avdala. I don't think one has to go that way. You could make Avdala. And bear in mind also that the Polish poscum are very cagey about women making Avdala. That's possibly why they're saying, let them eat without Avdala. We're not so, the Altarebbe doesn't have such a problem. So make Avdala, make Avdala a cup of coffee, make Avdala on a cup of tea, which is Khamar Medina. I, was, I think one should make Avdala. Um, and with, by using co coffee or tea, it avoids the question of having wine. Um, one last thing which I want to share with you, and that is that last week, I think, we had the discussion of, about the Shabbos boat. Uh, sorry, the, the, the boat Chabad. Uh, where there's a, a uh, flush system, which sometimes um, will activate a macerator, which, is like some, uh, an, uh, which works with electricity. And I'd mentioned about Sophic Psychratia being an Isra So I'm, that wasn't really correct. The, the correct term which I, which I should have used was, that a Sophic Psychratia for an Isra would be acceptable. One of the pioneers in halacha and technology is the late Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Halperin. Uh, and I think I've got, had a conversation with him or one of his, one of his staff about a, a, uh, an alarm where you've got, you, there's a sensor and you pass by and you're activating. And he was advising to set the sensor on a timer. So then, if you pass the time, pass the sensor, it's not sure whether the time, whether the sensor is on or not. That would be categorized as a sophic psychratia. We don't, you don't know what the circumstances are. Is there a uh, psychratia happening or not? It depends. It's beyond you, beyond your control. So, but the, the uh, and, and that's really one of his key psokim is key uh, solutions for halacha problems of this nature was to use a, uh, a timer to create a sophic psychratia. But that's because we're looking at electricity, which is a, which is a drabonon. Therefore it's a sophic psychratia by Isra drabonon. And therefore that I would think would also apply in our instance with the, with the macerator, you can also use this concept of sophic psychratia by Isra drabonon. If it were a Sophic Psychratia by Easter bin Atoira, then one wouldn't be allowed to, the Alter Rebbe says it's a Sophic Deraisa. So there the story is about closing a, a lid and you might be trapping animal or uh, in, inside the container. That could be a Lisa Deraisa. So Sophic Psychratia there, one would have to be Mahmir. Sophic Psychratia of an Easter Rabbonon, one can be more lenient. Um, so the one who raised this point with me said, if that's the case, then, and this I've actually seen in some of them, uh, some of the contemporary poskim, once you're saying that using this macerator is a Isra then we have Bichlal for Kovod Habrias. One can be Mekel to, to, be, to do an Isra the taking the stones, etc., which I mentioned in Simashin Yud base for Kovod Habrias, one would be uh, uh, permitted to uh, doing this at Rabbonum, which is a, which is a valid point, but certainly if it's a Sophic, it makes it more uh, comfortable to be more lenient about this. 